Good to go. I'm just waiting for it to come up on the screen. It appears that there's somebody else in the waiting room now. Yeah, one of the staff members, I'll let him in. Right. And we're good to go. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Central Coast Local Planning Panel. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today. And I acknowledge that that could be in all sorts of places, uh, given that we're electronic. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This meeting is being recorded and it's also being webcast. So I encourage everybody to bear that in mind in, in choosing what they say. Um, there is to be no recording or filming otherwise of this meeting unless the prior permission of the panel has been obtained and it hasn't been, so that's a no. Uh, the panel's decisions from the meeting and audio recording should be available on council's website ordinarily well within seven days of the meeting. Um, the other very preliminary thing I should say is please turn off your electronic devices or put them on silent um, and make sure you're free from interruptions. The panel members we have today are myself, Donna Rygate, and I'm the chair. We have Gary Fielding, who is an expert or professional panel member, Stephen Leafley, an expert or professional panel member, and David Kitson, who is the nominated community panel member. So I welcome all of you fellows to the meeting this afternoon. We have no apologies that I'm aware of. Um, the meeting today is going to consider the following development applications. DA 56560-2019, which is a proposed telecommunications tower on Brisbane Water Drive at Kuliwong. And DA 54122-2018, um, which is a proposed residential flat building and commercial premises at 34 to 36 Brisbane Water Drive, Kuliwong. The panel has been provided with assessment reports prepared by council staff, as well as public submissions that have been made on the applications. Site visits have been undertaken and council staff have also briefed the panel on the key issues the applications raise. We have some people registered to address the panel today in relation to the proposed telecommunications tower we have Helen Orchard, who is uh, representing the Kuliwong and Point Clare Tascot Progress Association. Uh, Paul Davidson, who is a, from Telstra and a representative of the applicant there. And I'm going to try and get this right. Kuda <laughs> Zinotzi, who is um, a representative also of Service Stream, the applicant. Um, in relation to the second application we're considering today, the proposed residential flat building and commercial premises, Helen Orchard has again registered to speak on that item and is again representing the Coolingwong and Point Clare Tascot Progress Association. Um, and we've also had register Michael Levy on behalf of the applicant and Andrew Dixon, architect, on behalf of the applicant. So welcome all of those people who've registered to speak to the meeting today. I know it's a little bit awkward um, having these meetings electronically when they're really designed to be face-to-face, -face, but um, I'd be grateful for your forbearance in, in making it all work. What we're going to do is hear from the speakers on the first agenda item and then hear from the applicants' representatives on that agenda item, then move on to the, uh, to the speakers for the, on, in relation to the second agenda item. Our usual practice is to allow individual members of the public three minutes to speak on the matter. That time can be extended with the agreement of the panel. Once members of the public speak, the applicant is given a maximum speaking time of 15 minutes to respond to all of the issues raised should they wish to. As the panel has been provided with copies of all the submissions received in response to the development applications, there's no need to repeat the points made in those submissions. I'd also ask that each speaker be heard in silence while they're addressing the panel and that courtesy and respect be observed throughout the meeting, please. 
There isn't to be any personal criticism directed at any speaker or at council staff. Um, that would be contrary to the panel's code of conduct and won't be accepted, and it adds nothing to the process of considering the matters at hand either. Um, panel members may ask questions of speakers to clarify our understanding of what's being said. And after hearing from the speakers, the panel might ask questions of council officers as well to clarify any matters raised. Um, after hearing from the speakers on each of the agenda items, the panel will adjourn the meeting to confer. If we were meeting in person, we might then reconvene the meeting to hand down our decisions, but given that it's an electronic meeting, that's, that's impractical. So we'll instead seek to have the panel's decisions up on council's website as soon as possible after the meeting. Um, at the conclusion of our deliberations, we might decide to either make a decision on the matter or if more information is required by the panel, the decision might be deferred either for a further public meeting or could to be dealt with electronically. Now that ends the, uh, the general introductory remarks. Thank you for bearing with me through those. And I'll move on to agenda item one, declarations of interest. We've received um, written declarations from all of the panel members. Um, I remind everybody about the requirements in the Code of Conduct um, about de declaring conflicts of interest. Does any member of the panel have a declaration of interest which has not previously been made? Oh, I don't. No, I don't. No. Nor, nor do I, Madam okay. Chair. Terrific. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item 2.0. Point one, the confirmation of the minutes of the previous meeting. The, meet, the minutes of the panel's meeting on the 11th of June have been circulated. Does anybody have any amendments to those minutes? Um, I was at that meeting, um, Chair, and uh, there's no changes to those minutes required in my view. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was too, and I would agree with that, other than there is a missing apostrophe... <laughs> which I will pass on to the Secretariat out of session. Um, can I have somebody, so you'd confirm those minutes, that would be accepted? Yeah. accepted. Um, should I second, even though I'm the chair, but I was there? Yes. Have I'll have to. Yeah, okay, so, seconded by me. All in favour? Aye. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the development applications that we're considering this afternoon. Um, as I said, we would like to hear from the speakers on, on, each of, on each of those applications in turn. So may I ask Helen Orchard, representing the Progress Association, to address the panel now in relation to the proposed telecommunications tower application. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on behalf of residents and ratepayers, we would like to point out that the public pass through our area. Residents reside 24 seven. Telstra's report into mission states the reason for positioning the tower at Kuliwong is to provide continuous mobile coverage along the railway line and, recre and to recreational users of Brisbane Water National Park. Going on Telstra's application, clause 423, mobile phone, radio communications infrastructure, design page 49, states A, the primary requirement for the proposal is to deliver 4G services to rail commuters who are moving through the, Bris through the Kuliwong area, as well as people using Brisbane water and the surrounding national park for recreational purposes. The proposal will ensure that Telstra is able to meet its customers' current and growing demands for mobile data services or devices. Our, resp our response is that Kuliwong has been adequately covered by the rollout of the NBN. Two, the aim of the proposal is to provide improved Telstra coverage to rail commuters and others moving through Kuliwong area. The two antennas will be positioned to face north and south directions, the general direction of the train corridor. Our response is that Telstra is putting residents of Glenrock Parade and surrounds in jeopardy due, due to the unknown effect of the M MEEs radiating from the towers as the height of the towers are in line with residents' living areas. Our response is that the towers fall within, don't fall within the, the towers fall within the tower, uh, council's LEP, which is the LEP is, includes height restrictions. The locality is made up of a thin stretch of 
nestled between the Brisbane Water and Brisbane Water National Park. It com com comprises of residential zoning made up of single dwelling allotments and infrastructure zoning made up of the, the train corridor. The zoning of the site is not associated with any specific height control, which is refer, which we refer to the LEP, and allows for the construction of telecommunication towers. The proposed development is deemed compatible and acceptable in terms of future character of the area. Some views will be disturbed. However, a redesign and relocation of the proposal has resulted to ensure the disturbance does not amount to an unreasonable level. This will also result in reduced impacts to the character of the area. Our response is, why should residents who have abided by council zoning heights and controls suffer loss of views which are protected by the New South Wales Land and Environment Court be interrupted by these towers to purely benefit Telstra's financial gain. In conclusion, residents of our area are fully aware of the beauty in, of the environment and are protective of it. We request that these towers be rejected or be moved to the nearby national park where the electric, electromagnetic field emissions may well bring damage to the tree canopy and not to the residents' wellbeing. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comprehensive and um, very well-timed address. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, um, now I'd like to provide the opportunity um, and um, I'm not sure which of the, the speakers on behalf of the applicant wish to, wish to go first. I'll, I'll let you two sort that out amongst yourselves uh, to make any comments that you'd like to to make in response to um, Ms Orchard's address. Sure, Donna. <clears throat> Paul Davidson's my name. I'll go first. Uh, can I just ask you a quick question? There was some um, photo montages sent to the department um, a few days ago. Have you got those? They would have been sent to... to um... That you sent it through to council? Yes. Yes. Yes, we have. They were included in... Um, some of the material that was circulated to us. So have all, have all members of the community got those? Yeah, correct. I believe so. All right. Okay, Donna, um, I represent Tulsa, so I'll start if you don't mind. Okay. We've got nine, we've got nine minutes, have I? Okay. Um, okay, Paul Davidson is my name. I'm a Senior Project Manager for Tulsa representing at this hearing. Um, broadly speaking, the, the project was initiated by the Federal and New South Wales Government, who have allocated about $16 million to improve mobile coverage between Sydney and Newcastle. Telstra has been awarded the Hornsby to Wyong section, and Telstra has been working with Sydney Trains plus the three levels of government, along with the community, to undertake this critical infrastructure project. The Federal members were Robertson, Lucy Wilkes MP, <coughs> said that it's an important step forward in supporting thousands of local hardworking commuters who are currently experiencing blackouts or black spots, as she refers to, and also dropouts along the rail corridor. Um, the general purpose of this installation is to provide communication in the rail corridor between Hornsby and Wyong, and in this case, Kulawa, due to the poor coverage, capacity, and services of the trains, which provide over 280 services a week and carry over 30,000 people a day. New mobiles will also improve the coverage of the local communities of Coolawong and Tascot. Um, broadly speaking, now the revised proposal is to erect at what's referred to as a 25 metre slimline pole with an overall height, which means the antennas are a little bit higher, to 26.2. And they include two antennas, one facing generally north and one facing generally south, and associated equipment, um, which will cover these dead spots, which uh, can't be covered by the two Telstra sites that are currently in the area one being the Tulsa uh, site at the reservoir in called Coolawong Reservoir and, and the other one at the north just referred to as Tascot. Um, if I refer to you to the photos or the photo montages, um, these are the new photo montages that have been taken. Um, so broadly speaking, what's occurred is that during the consultation period, um, it was made aware to Telstra that um, certain people in um, the community had views which we were most likely obstructing, which is as per the second photo. We've now moved the um, proposal up about 45 metres. And you, as you can, well, you can't quite see it, you can see the red arrow. The actual tower actually falls in behind the trees. So there's no visual effect on compared to the original aspect 
Um, so by doing that, we've, in, we've lowered the tower by five metres, we've moved it 43 metres, so it's now um, obscured by trees and visual um, screening. And um, also the, the pole and the tower will be colour matched so that it also blends in with the environment. Um, and you should be able to clearly see that on the two photo montages. In relation to EME, um, Telstra is a carrier, as you're probably aware. Um, we rely on the World Health Authority and the Australian Agency, which is referred to as a PANZA, as the governing body and standard authority, to which they set a public exposure limit of safety limit uh, of what's referred to as 100%. Now, the current prediction for this site is 0.63. So it's, it's well below 1% of the 100% standard. The closest resident in Glenrock Parade would have a smaller prediction. Their prediction is about 0.28 and there's a small playground <clears throat> up the road uh, or along the corridor, sorry, <clears throat> which is referred to as 0.013%. So as you can see, those percentages are, <clears throat> are all well below 1% um, of the 100% standard. Uh, just moving forward in probably co-locations. Um, co-location is where a number of carriers or carriers uh, share infrastructure. In this case, um, what Telstra will be doing was Telstra will be allowing uh, sufficient capacity, structural capacity for one additional carrier, thus recognising that if, for example, Optus would like to share that infrastructure, we don't end up having another pole, you know, 20 metres up the road somewhere to install Optus. They can be installed on this pole. So um, that's sort of the way that the communications industry works. Um, as I said, in conclusion, Tulsa has undertaken extensive investigation to finding the best solution for the community while fully catering for the objectives of the the government and the people that use the rail transport corridor. Um, we believe that the position that we've chosen now has a far better visual appearance, as in you virtually can't see it from, from those areas. It, we've reduced it by five metres, obviously lessening the effect. And we will also, as I said, colour it. And um, we believe that the installation now will um, fit into the environment without restricting any person's views or whatever. Um, in relation to the previous speaker, um, at the end, if you don't mind, we'll just come back, if that's all right. Sorry? Uh, sorry. In relation to comments on by the previous speaker, uh, after Kuda speaks, we could, we'll could come back to those, if that's all right. This is your opportunity to respond to the comments made by the previous speaker. Um, sure. you've, you've got 4.52 4 minutes left, so yes, please. Um, is that me or is Kuda? I think you're collective because you're responding on behalf of the applicant. I'll let Kuda speak. Okay. So, yeah, I can probably add on to that. Um, uh, thank you all. Um, I am uh, from Service Stream representing uh, Telstra. Um, I would just like to point out that um, we consider the proposal is consistent, firstly, with the um, objectives of the zone SP2 under the uh, Central Coast Council's LEP. Um, this proposal is going to provide um, uh, infrastructure and that will support, you know, uh, other other uses. Um, it, it, it also doesn't present a development that is not compatible with the zone or may detract from the uh, rail corridor. We consider this to be a good planning practice in terms of um, uh, co-location of, um, you know, uh, infrastructure or co-siting of infrastructure and we consider that also as Paul raised because this proposal will be able to um, add additional carrier infrastructure so if, if, if Optus in the future um, it, it, it will not result in any any more additional towers being built in the area. Now to respond I noticed um, there was a statement made by the previous speaker about uh, height controls. Um, I would like to uh, note that in this area According to the LEP, um, there is uh, no height um, control that is uh, applicable at this zoning. Um, and as such, as, uh, as these are telecommunication facilities, um, they require to have line of sight. So in order for them to actually function, um, they, must be, uh, they must protrude above you know, the topography, so that is trees and et cetera. Um, we consider that, um, uh, proposing an actual new monopole, it's it's usually a last option. Um, we always go through a, a, a site selection process, which involves um, uh, exploring any viable candidates 
to uh, put our infrastructure on. Um, in this case, uh, we looked at three other um, um, potential uh, monopoles that are in the area. There's a couple of um, um, uh, Sydney trains owned uh, towers. Uh, we explored options there, but for, for uh, property reasons and technical reasons, we were unfortunately unable to put our, our new antennas on there. Uh, we also looked at a, uh, another lattice tower um, that is located further south. Um, this, this, this tower already includes Telstra equi equipment. Uh, it also includes other carrier equipment. And uh, unfortunately for technical reasons, uh, we were unable to install our um, antennas at this location. So essentially we have uh, gone through other options and from a planning perspective, if we were to locate our antennas on another or an existing structure, we would not need to uh, uh, lodge a DA. We, we, there are, um, I guess, controls under the federal legislation for telecommunications and state legislation that allow, um, uh, uh, I guess, infrastructure to be installed without a DA and we have to go through a certain notification process. So essentially we consider this proposal here at um, within the rail corridor as uh, the most feasible option um, following our uh, investigations. And we also consider that it is uh, consistent with uh, the LEP and uh, general planning, planning requirements. Thank you. Now, um, Mr. Dixon, you've got some further comments to make in yeah, response um, to... There was a comment made about uh, the service being NBN. NBN don't, are a fixed line. They don't actually have mobiles. So um, there's probably a little bit of confusion about the technology there. Um, this is actually for mobile coverage. It's not for fixed line coverage. Um, it, well, you, we addressed the AME. The AME is, as I said, well below 1%. Um, uh, the loss of views we've, we've addressed by the photomontages that we've just given you. Um, and Kudus just addressed the flight restrictions. Um, so, yeah, so that's what we said. Thank you. Fantastic. And you've come in within time too. Good on you. Thanks a lot. 25 seconds to go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, does, I'll, I'll open it up now to questions from members of the panel for our speakers this afternoon. Um, who wants to go first? Gentlemen. Stephen, you've got your hand up. Where you go? Yes, I'd just like to um, ask Miss Orchard if she would like to respond or if she's seen the... Um, Photo montages which show that those dwellings are not impacted visually, um, and also like a comment at all after hearing the applicant in relation to the EME um, issue. David, I'm not sure if Helen actually has those copies because they're only sent to the um, the council. I'm not sure if Helen actually has those, the latest ones. Yes, well, I don't know. It's been from the council whether they've sent them to her. But if they don't, if those, I guess I'll, I'll catch it another way. Uh, Helen, if those towers uh, cannot be uh, seen from those residents, would that satisfy you in relation to that particular issue? And would you like to respond in relation to the comments made in respect to the EMEs? Well, both, because the, the, the towers will still be seen from our foreshore reserves and places like that. And with the EMEs, um, there is, I think, to my way of thinking, that I know the World Health Organisation says so-and-so, but I think really it's coming into play now that the question is still out there. And um, living under high-tension wires myself and having cancer and various cancers and things like that, I think the question is still out there. That's all I've got to say. And I've got members of the the members of the public or the association that are knocking at my door saying they're worried they've got about emissions and things like that. So that's that's all I can say. Thank you. And Mr. Davidson, the colour of the towel, what is it going to be exactly? Uh, I, I, look, I suppose, Stephen, it, it's it's very hard to give you an exact colour. Um, we're quite happy with council to uh, uh, donate a colour. Uh, it, it's normally referred, uh, the colour we normally use is a colour called pale eucalypt, um, which I suppose it's a bit hard to describe, but I, I suppose if you imagine a, 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 um, a eucalypt tree, the actual colour of the actual leaf, but the, the pole can be coloured to any colour. Um, for example, you know, um, a, a different green, 
uh, a black possibly you know black tends to disappear sometimes uh, but yeah it can be colored to any any color that um, the council chooses that you know that would enhance would uh, I suppose for a better word blend in with the environment all the questions I have yeah. that's you Stephen yep okay Gary I have no questions madam chair okay David do you have any questions You there, sorry, Dave? No, sorry, no, I don't have any questions either. Yeah. Could okay. I just say one thing? Yes. Like our area, which is 6,000 residents, we, ha we had a, a petition went round and there were about 300 signatures for this petition. I just thought I'd put that in against the towers. So. Thank you. We've received copies of the petition as well. So I can see a long, long, long list of, of names and signatures. Thank you. Um, I'd just like the, the applicants to, to tell us a little bit more about the electromagnetic energy and the 0.63 or 0.68% out of 100% issue, um, just to, to really, um, to the extent they can, put people's mind at ease in relation to the to the radiation issue. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Um, I'm not an EME expert, but basically what it is is the, the World Health Authority and a PANSA, which is the government, Australian government authority, um, what they've done is that they've set a what's referred to as a public exposure level safety limit. And what they use is they use a percentage of 100%. So I, I suppose in essence... So 100% is safe? Is that what that means? Yes, yes, yes. What right. they're saying is that uh, in practice you could you could go to, for a better word, 99.999 and according to the World Health Authority and a PANSA, that is regarded as, as, as safe. And now in saying that, there's also a safety factor above 100%. So it's not as though it just goes from unsafe to safe just by ticking over that, that small percentage. <clears throat> um, so in relation to the percentage that, that we're anticipating from this base station, it's 0.63, which is obviously uh, less than 1% um, of, the, of the, uh, the safety limit. So I suppose uh, the way I normally explain it is that if, if, a, if a person was standing up 100% at the top of their head, where we're sitting is basically the their, their shoe level or their, their sole level on their shoe. So there's a there's a long way to go between um, what the authority, as in the PANS and World Health Authority, um, would call safe. Um, most of our base stations, um, even with with what's referred to as all technologies, which would be third generation, fourth generation, and sometimes, uh, depending on where they, where they are, the 5G, um, most of those base stations would still sit in the realm of around about 10% at the most. So they're still, you know, um, a long way away from what's referred to as the health standard. Uh, the, the comment regarding the, the resonance, um, the prediction there is actually less. It's actually 0.28 for the closest person. And as I said, the, the playground, I think it's to the north, uh, north is uh, 0.13. So that's obviously a lot less than one. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anybody else from the panel have any, anything else to to raise in relation to this matter, or shall we move on to the second application we're considering this afternoon? No, nothing further, Madam Chair. Thank you. No. Okay. Um, oh, can I just make one, just, just one quick statement? Um, as I said, this is a, a, an issue by the federal and state government. There's actually somewhere around about I think 25 um, uh, mobile towers in this in this what we refer as as network so to speak. Uh, and I um, so there's a number of sites similar to this where the the coverage um, because of, of uh, geographical or height or or tree cover or whatever um, also require um, you know, a tower or another installation. So it's, it's part of a, of a big picture, I suppose, for a better word. Yep. Anyway. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, um, yep. Mr. Davidson and Mr. Zinotese.
Um, you'll probably be leaving us shortly. Ms Orchard, thank you. And um, I'll invite you now that we're moving on to hear from people speaking in relation to the second DA we're looking at this afternoon, which is the proposed residential flat building and commercial premises. And our first speaker again is Helen Orchard representing the Progress Association. The Curly Wong and Point Clear Tascot Progress Association, including West Gosford, object to the development of this non compliant complex due to the size and density and the perceived traffic problems that would cause conflicting tra traffic use by the development being opposite a busy commuter rail level crossing on the main Northern Railway line <coughs> to Sydney, which is Curly Wong Railway Station at the intersection of Glenrock Parade, being the collector road between Curly Wong and Point Clear emptying out onto Brisbane Water Drive, which is the main road between Woi Woi Peninsula and West Gosford, for over the 6,000 residents of Park Bay, Cooleywong, Tascot and Point Clare. Residents of the area over time have abided to Gosford Council's development control plan re-height and four-floor setback for the area. This non-compliant development as applied for in the current DA has shown no regard for the overshadowing of neighbouring neighbours stating that this will only occur during the winter months. The association perceives that this is when the strategic use of urban deciduous trees has prevailed to ensure that warmth and light enter households living areas during the winter months, thus energy saving and not competing with climate change. Three, the Progress Association is concerned that drainage from this development shows catchment into the adjoining children's play equipment area in Cooch Park on Brisbane Water foreshore, locally called our secret pocket park and bathing area used by locals with heavy use during school vacation times by paddlers, sea scouts, and along with the general public for passive recreation. Four, the Progress Association is concerned that this development no way adheres to the character of the area and beings developed purely for financial gain with no respect or empathy for the adjoining neighbourhood. We, re we recommend that this DA not be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now I would like to invite the representatives of the applicant to say a few words, um, either um, Michael Levy or Andrew Dixon, and you people can decide amongst yourself who goes first. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair and panel members. Michael Levy here. Look, we've just got a few brief comments to make and then both Andrew and uh, myself would be available for comments. Um, uh, we, we support the council assessment and the uh, recommendations from council planners and believe the development is appropriate for the site, which has a business zoning uh, and is within immediate proximity to a heavy rail train station and also to bus services, both north, south, northbound and southbound and has a reserve located to the rear. Um, we, we, we appreciate the comments that have been made by community members and would like to reinforce that this land is a little bit different to some other land in Kuliwong in that it does have a business zoning. And with respect to the impacts, um, the proposal is supported by a traffic assessment uh, prepared by a traffic engineer addressing those traffic impacts and has found that to be reasonable no objections been raised by the RMS to the proposal. And also, too, th this site is quite strategically located. And for residents, they have a number of transport choices, um, both private and public transport. Uh, with respect to the setbacks, uh, the proposal does comply with the, um, the, the foreshore setback and the setback to the rear. And also, with respect to drainage and the park, there's a specific uh, solution that's been put forward for this proposal, which involves a number of treatment measures and level spreaders so as to uh, protect water quality, uh, leaving the site and towards the park. With the shadowing, um, obviously midwinter is the worst case. And so that is what we've based our assessment on, which is um, a common practice. During other times of the year, uh, shadowing is obviously going to be a lot less on adjoining sites. But having regard to the solar access that is protected, um, we believe the proposal um, is reasonable. And again, noting that the site has a, um, a commercial zoning with a higher development capacity than uh, surrounding residential properties and um, larger building forms are expected 
through the additional uh, development capacity that's afforded to those properties. So th there are our comments and some brief um, responses to um, uh, Helen Orchard's comments. Uh, we'll now um, answer any questions that the panel might have. So, so Mr. Dixon doesn't want to say anything at this point? Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy to answer questions, I guess. Um, I think Michael summed up the majority. Okay, so I think it's, it's probably Gary's turn to go first. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I've got three areas of questioning, um, and this would be either to Mr Levy or to Mr Dixon. The, um, the departures from the apartment design guide uh, in respect of building separation, um, I'd just like to hear from you, please, what urban design justification you may wish to offer in support of those departures. Yeah, I can answer that if you like. Um, so we we can have this is the second design solution that we've brought to the proposal. Um, what we're proposing here is um, understanding that the site is quite unique, uh, or this little precinct, this pocket is quite unique in that it it fronts onto a fairly major road, um, and then it trans uh, transitions down to um, open space in the waterfront, obviously. Uh, and we are surrounded to the northeast in particular and to the southeast um, by residential properties. Um, the northeast is only a fairly new property, so we understand that the scale through there will be such that um, it will probably stay a two story dwelling for some time. The rest of the properties to the west, particularly on the corridor, are all fairly, um, fairly old, um, outdated, um, and are, are likely to be renewed at some point in time particularly considering the proximity to the railway line, the railway station, the main road. So from an urban design perspective and an architectural perspective, what we've done is we've, we've addressed those uh, segments through the site and transitioned through the site from one on the western side on the main road as more of an urban, an urban edge and transition that to the east to a more residential frontage. Um, in doing so, um, we've proposed to locate the predominant building form centrally to the site and um, for the, the residential components and then uh, with the three-storey building and then a two-storey more townhome type or terrace um, scale uh, addressing the park that nestles in between the other residential two-storey dwellings either side of that. Uh, in order to do that, um, what we've done is we've use the principles in the uh, um, apartment design guide which looks at using similar scale and similar frontage to the surrounding properties where we're filling into existing areas particularly areas that aren't going to change um, in, the, in the short term so those terraces or the, the townhomes that are facing the park um, we've we've brought them to a similar scale as the adjoining properties uh, two-story we have their front door facing the street side and we have their open space, private open space facing the park side, which is the same as what's happening either side. We don't have any windows on the lower level in particular facing from the living spaces facing onto the side uh, properties either side. We have the main bedroom facing um, the, the, the eastern side, the park on the upper level. We've got a secondary bedroom facing into the site. Um, which is, I suspect, where the main concern for building separation is that you're, you're referring to, Gary. Um, and then we've got a, a third bedroom or a study type space, which actually does face um, to the side boundaries, but um, it's, a, it's a fairly small space. It's not meant to be used as a public, uh, public space generally. So in terms of the way that we've oriented that, we've, we've done that in a way so that we can minimise any impacts on surrounding properties. The separation between that building and the main uh, the central apartment building, the residential flat building. What we're proposing there is we've located on the ground floor of the townhomes, we've located the dining space, which is not usually a space that has a lot of activity, uh, a lot of active use um, throughout the day. We've located that adjacent or closer to the apartment building, um, which is within the, the setbacks. Um, the setbacks there, I believe, I've just got the numbers here, are 7.4 metres between the living space on the ground floor of the apartment building, GO2, and the living, the dining spaces of those terraces. But we also, on that level, we've also got um, courtyard walls around the, um, the apartments, GO2 and GO1. 
So those, any visual impacts or sound impacts are mitigated by the fact that we are on ground level. We have a, a garden wall typical to any apartment, any um, house um, from one place to the next. Um, and then the upper floor, um, we have the bedroom that has a screened loggia for privacy that can be controlled by the occupant of the terraces. That, and we've also got using that as a, um, a secondary sound baffle to, um, to the upper level apartment there looking in. So we've, yeah. we've addressed it through a design perspective, I guess is probably the best way to describe it. Um, can, 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 just interrupting Mr. Dixon, um, with the central apartments, the setbacks that you're proposing to the um, southern and northern boundaries mm -hmm. um, are about half the distance that the apartment design guide suggests would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and of course you have a rather extensive balcony for each of those apartments. Mm. The, 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 um, the extent of those balconies that run along the southern face and the northern face, but why, why do they need to be that depth given um, the extent of the other part of the balconies facing, uh, uh, facing east? I guess we've, what we've proposed there is to provide that wraparound balcony so that um, from those apartments centrally located, you, um, we're providing some privacy from and to the adjoining properties by the fact that they're fairly deep. You can't see the balconies provide an awning effectively um, looking down into any other properties. So that was probably the main reason. Whether they need to be as wide as that on the northern and southern boundaries, um, that could be reduced if need be. Um, the, the intention is not for those side spaces. The, the way the apartments are designed is such that the, the main space would be to the east that you'd be using as a, as a dining space or a, a a usable space. Yes. The, the southern and northern are certainly not designed to be um, active spaces. So mm -hmm. they, they could well be reduced if need be. Okay. And just uh, can I move on to my second, <laughs> my three questions, please? Mm -hmm. um, and that concerns the proposal for two, two driveway accesses mm -hmm. to the site. Mm -hmm. I, so guess, I guess I'd be just interested in. Um, trying to establish the real need for those two accesses, mm -hmm. which then, you know, reduce what would be the potential for more active street frontage mm -hmm. to Brisbane Water Drive. Yep. Um, so we've, we've really um, dealt with those two driveway frontages to mitigate any uh, conflicts between the retail or, or commercial use on the street. Um, and there, in engagement with the site and the residents. So um, that was a, an initial desire, I guess, to, to have that um, any mitigation of future owners having problems with commercial tenants and, and visitors using those spaces. Um, I guess in an ideal world, the parking, um, the parking solution for the site would probably be predominantly in the basement, which we've done. Um, and I think there's still some street spaces, parking spaces on the street available that could quite easily be used for uh, the retail or the, the commercial premise at front. Yes. Um, and that would open up that, that space for landscaping or alfresco space. It, it, it could be quite a, quite a yeah. nice place. And, uh, no, thank, thank you. And, if I could just um, add to that. Sorry. The, the, the footprint of the basement as, as it sits is pretty well there's not a lot of room to move there in terms of accommodating additional parking. And I think the, the idea around the second driveway and that parking was to be able to, to comply with the, the parking code requirements, which is two spaces for the commercial. But I, I think in practice, you're likely to have an owner um, or somebody running that shop mm -hmm. wanting to park. But I think um, people visiting or using it are, are probably quite unlikely to drive to the site for that specific purpose. So if there was some some capacity, for example, to, to be able to consider uh, one space being provided, um, there may be some capacity to be able to provide that um, in, in the basement uh, area, which I think would still reasonably cater for the commercial yes. use. No, thanks, Mr. Cleavy. That, that's, that's quite helpful. Just my final question, and... Um, 
I guess this would go to you, Mr. Levy. In calculating the gross floor area of the development, and of course that has given rise to the need for a clause 4.6 request, um, did you include the excess car parking in that gross floor area? Um, no, the, um, the additional car parking wasn't included, but it's within a basement space. Um, and, and I don't believe being in a basement would, would uh, uh, qualify as gross floor area in that it has no, no impact on the uh, external bulk or appearance of the development. Mm, okay. No, I'm, I'm just conscious of the way gross floor area is actually defined in the in, in the LEP. That that's um, something we can turn our minds to shortly. But um, no, there's well seven excess parking spaces, which translate to, according to my rough calculations, about 100 square meters of floor space. Yeah. And, um, and, and look, I think our response there is that the, the provision of additional parking is is all below ground level. So it has no external impact, but probably has a number of benefits for the surrounding area in terms of the capacity to be able to provide for uh, for, for residents' vehicles. So we, we, we see a lot of benefit in, in that modest um, uh, additional yeah. parking that's provided, and it, it doesn't in any way sort of impact on the intensity of the use or the uh, the external bulk. I, I, I don't have that uh, definition of the uh, gross floor area in front of me to be able to sort of respond to it, but it is, yeah. it is basement space. No, no, th thank you. And I understand where you're coming from. It may be that um, what we're dealing with with the clause 4.6 is in fact a greater departure on FSR than um, it has been proposed at this stage, but that's something we can we can consider separately. Um, and Ma Madam Chair, just with, with with your indulgence, if I could just make one brief comment about one of Gary's earlier comments around the um, the compliance with the ADG that that, that that there is a variation, minor variation, I, I, I think, to the side setback required, um, but with respect to the balance of the design uh, criteria in the apartment design guide, the proposal either meets or exceeds the requirements um, in the areas of communal open space, uh, deep soil, solar access, um, you know, the size of the apartments and the open space and so forth. But it's, it's also worthwhile just keeping in mind that this land has a business zoning and um, through diff other development forms has the capacity to actually be able to build to the side boundaries, potentially to two storeys for commercial related property. So it is a little bit different to a residential property. And also to I mean, the, the, the ADG um, and SEP 65 does apply, but a three storey flat building is certainly, I think at the lower end of its application, it certainly doesn't apply to two storey development. Yeah. And I think it is primarily intended for larger development forms and council's underlying controls for a building like this would allow two storey walls to be built 3.5 metres, a minimum of 3.5 metres from the side boundary with an average of four. And then for the top, uh, the top level to, um, to be able to be built you know, to a minimum of six metres, but then with a slightly larger average. So, you know, that would be a, a wedding cake uh, type approach that would in fact push the development closer to the side boundaries at the lower levels. And what the approach that we've taken is to balance that out and to actually increase for certainly the lower two levels, that amount of setback. And then the top level follows that same alignment but the building certainly could be closer to the boundaries at the lower level. So there's a, a, a bit of a balancing approach that's been taken there. No, th thank you, Mr. Levy. Hmm. Okay, is that your list, Gary? Oh, it is my list, thank you, yes. Okay, Stephen? Yeah, um, just if I can get you to please comment, um, just respond to this Orchard's uh, uh, concerns regarding stormwater, what's happening with stormwater from this site. Gary's covered most of the other issues. Um, the only other one, I guess, uh, is just that northern driveway and the two additional car parking 
spaces and the and if that was to be deleted what that space might be used for would it be um, landscaping uh, another commercial space or some sort of alfresco dining area noting that there's a, a unit I think over the over the top of it so and I and I think Gary made some good points there regarding the activation there at the street front. I also note from a, a you know the proposal being close to the railway lines in line with state government strategic policy to try and increase uh, population densities around um, railway stations and what have you. I don't know whether you want to comment on that in relation to some of the development standard issues that are under discussion here. And also, if um, if that northern driveway was to be removed, what might happen with uh, car parking for that space and uh, waste disposal as well. And I've got another issue which I'll come back to after you've uh, addressed those matters. Um, and, and Andrew, we'd like to respond from the design point of view. I've, I've got I've, I've got some thoughts on the car parking that I could add. Uh... Yeah, so um, removing the drive, I'll start with removing the driveway um, on the northern side if we were to do that, then I, I definitely see that that would be an ideal alfresco, a landscaped alfresco um, space. Uh, the ideal use for that um, retail commercial space would be a, a cafe or, or uh, and, and that outdoor space would be a, an ideal location for that. Um, the alternative is it could just be, be simply landscaped and to provide some more um, softening back down through to the streetscape. Um, but I think thinking of, well, off the cuff, obviously, um, I think a courtyard space would be quite pleasant. It would also be a quite pleasant place to arrive into that retail space as well and a spill out space. Um, in terms of bin collection, um, it would just be the, the, the bins would be wheeled out to the street. We've got street collection for garbage um, for the proposal. So that wouldn't change that at all uh, for the retail. Uh, the, the bins are already on the other side, access to the street. On the commercial, other uh, the residential entry side, so there would be no change there. Stormwater, uh, there've been quite a lot of discussions backwards and forwards with council's um, engineering section, um, assessment section, and um, initial proposals that we worked through um, have been amended in accordance with council's requests. And as a such, we're we're treating the um, the, the discharge in a way that meets council's requirements um, and we're actually discharging back to council's stormwater system um, just up to the north in the park area not um, we're not discharging underground through the site which is what we were proposing originally can you, if, if i could just add to that um on, on the waste collection there would be virtually no change if that driveway weren't there in the the, the collection was not an on uh, bringing a truck um on site, but it was taking the bins out to the street. So it would just mean that an access path would need to be provided, but it wouldn't wouldn't interrupt those requirements. Um, the, the the car parking that's that's provided is, um, I mean, Council's DCP expresses a, min, a minimum. It's, it's not a, um, a maximum number of spaces, but there, there, there could be a, an alternative of being able to locate um, uh, or allocate parking so that, for example, each of the two bedroom units, uh, three bedroom units had two spaces each. Um, each of the one bedroom units had uh, one each, which is a total of 23 car parking spaces. And that then leaves capacity for a, a commercial space, which the, the owner operator of, of that uh, commercial area would be able to use and one visitor space, which, which is below the nominal uh, three visitor spaces specified in the DCP. But this solution would also be providing an additional um, eight spaces for units, which would in themselves have capacity to be able to be used for, um, for visitors as well. So that could be an alternative solution that still, still provides a reasonable amount of, of car parking for the residential units but also has that capacity to be able to cater for um, a, a space for the commercial use and also uh, potentially for at least one, one um, uh, permanent nominated visitor spot, but with the additional spaces for the three bedroom units also being available for visitors if required. Okay, thank you. Stephen, you had something else you wanted to raise? Yeah, so, so the other issue I wanted to just raise with um, 
Dixon was, I noticed the application was lodged back in 2018. So it's been in the system for some time. As, as professionals, um, we have responsibilities regarding these processing times and that's, that's, that's an issue. Um, I note that the original application as lodged far exceeded the height controls um, and it, it appears to have been uh, like an amber, amber claim in terms of what was, what was done on this site. Um, I guess on, that just concerns me a little bit that applications are being lodged like that and then that and how that then reflects back mainly on the council. And I think as uh, applicants, applicants have also got a responsibility uh, to ensure when they're lodging applications that they lodge applications that uh, I suppose comply as much as possible with, the, with the, the planning framework that applies to a site so that the council's got an opportunity to determine the application uh, in as a uh, as expediently as possible, especially with this application having been in for two years. And I wouldn't like to think this sort of thing is happening uh, across a lot of applications in, on the Central Coast. If, if I could just respond to that, Madam Chair, um, the initial application um, certainly was not an ambit claim. Um, the, the application as submitted and the request for the variation to the height made very clear that one of the grounds that it was being sought on was to enable the provision of a large communal open space area at the rear of the site adjoining the park and that and something that was going to potentially impact less on the houses either side and that was that was made very clear um, the responses from the council and the public submissions raised some concern with the height that was provided and as a result this revised proposal the, the floor space ratio is not a, lot di uh, not a lot different to the original one, but what we've done is return to, I guess, a more traditional approach of putting some residential units in that rear area. So it wasn't, it wasn't an ambit claim or looking to, um, to, to seek something that wasn't there. It was actually part of the considered um, design approach. For Can I just, could I just also add there that um, the original proposal was for a four-storey building, not a three-storey building. Um, so it certainly wasn't numerically the third story when you've only got um, um, low height limits, uh, small height limits. The third story compared to a fourth story means that the fourth story is a significant variation to height, obviously. Um, but it's, it certainly wasn't an ambit claim. We, we, we were basically looking at consolidating the majority of the building footprint into the centre of the site to minimise any issues and overlooking and other problems to surrounding properties and to provide a, a complete open park, parkland spaces, as Michael mentioned, between the two residential properties that are adjacent to the park. So um, there was quite a lot of work that went into that initial design um, and we believe that it was a, uh, a quite a, a, an appropriate design form for this location. Um, we also, prior to lodging the application, met with senior council staff um, on a couple of occasions to run through our various ideas and options. And we received uh, tacit, uh, not approval obviously, but, but tacit support for the way that we were going because they could see that there was an urban design benefit going forward. Um, we proceeded to lodge the applications on that basis. And um, as time has gone on, um, lots of things have changed through uh, the Central Coast Council um, in that time. And um, we no longer have that had that same support and the community seemed to be quite concerned about it. At one stage, um, we understood community was talking about us having a 14 storey building. Um, there was a 14 RL, RL8 to HD uh, on the building, not 14 storeys. So there was a lot of miscommunication out there, unfortunately. Um, so we, um, we decided, or our, our client decided to put it back to a more compliant approach to height uh, as well. Uh, and that's why we've got the current proposal as it currently stands. And that's this in this instance, that's the reason why it's taken so long to go through the approval process. I'm happy with that response, Madam Chair. Any anything else to raise? I have a question. Um, if if you don't mind, we might um, run through the questions from the panel members. Sorry, can I? jump in um yes it's your turn david where you go yeah, thank you yes um look i guess i um i question why you didn't design this um to comply with council six meter uh, building line um especially for the residential part of it 
Um, and I also um, understand that, um, you know, if the, the, um, if the front section is um, um, used for um, road widening, uh, there'll be a new building line uh, at the um, at the southern entrance, uh, which um, you know potentially if, if there's a road widening at the front and the cycle, you know, because there's a regional cycleway that runs runs along this uh, site, um, that you will have um, uh, less uh, side distance from uh, cars leaving the site than uh, than you have uh, at the moment uh, from the site. That's one, that's one issue I, I, I would like to get a response. Yeah, we'll, we'll deal with that one and then we'll come back to you for your further issues. Who would like to address that issue? Um, look, if, uh, if, maybe in response, one of the things that's, as I've said, sets his site apart is it is in fact designed for business purposes and it is a, a regular uh, an accepted practice for commercial development to build uh, close to or on the front uh, boundary, um, and the proposal has, um, has has followed that requirement. Um, with respect to the road widening, this this is this is not a formal identified road widening. It's something that the RMS have asked to be included uh, in the event that something happens in the future, and I think that the proposal has re reasonably responded to that. And um, the proposal as, as put forward and the location of the road as it is at the moment uh, complies in terms of the available site distances. I'll add to that. Um, when council was advised by RMS that there was a um, possible road widening um, through there, that part of the site, or that, that uh, southern part of the site in particular on the, the boundary, um, council advised us that that was the case. It's certainly not something that's on any planning instrument or, or any um, 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 land ownership documentation. So uh, as soon as we found that out, we, we amended the design to suit and there've been quite a few changes in that regard from the first concept to this concept. So that, that's been addressed. And we've also been working with council's um, engineering staff as well to make sure that we're meeting their specific requirements for uh, sight lines, sight distances. So we meet the Australian standards there. Uh, and that's something that we have been backwards and forwards with council on as well. Okay. Can I ask a question as Helen? Um, if you don't mind, we'll just finish the panel's questions. And then although it's a little bit irregular, I certainly will let you ask a question just because you've been so kind in sticking with us through the whole thing. David, back to you. I, I guess um, I, question whether the um, traffic engineering advice has been based on the existing site and not what the future site might be. Um, it's certainly been dealt with by the future site. And has also been referred to RMS to comment and they've, they've raised no issues with the application or any safety aspects. Yeah. That we've actually pulled the driveway away from the southern, the main driveway to the basement, away from the southern boundary to meet those requirements. Away from the southern boundary? Correct. Why there's a kink would... in the driveway now, as opposed no? to, there's a kink in the driveway now, as opposed to originally it was running straight out towards the street um, to address that. I'm not quite clear I understand that. I, I would have thought that, uh, as I understood it, the side distance, uh, the best side distance from the um, uh, the high point uh, um, north of this site um, required that the, you know, the best location for a driveway was on the, the very southern end of this site. Is that not the case? We have located the main driveway to the southern end of the site, yeah. but. We have located to the southern end of the site. Yes, it is in the best location from a site distance yeah. from the, yeah. the top of the hill. Yeah, okay. I'm just not sure what the comment was. Oh, what mine was more specific to the actual driveway design itself, meeting site distances for uh, pedestrians and cyclists on the path um, heading north from the southern end. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I guess what I'm I'm the, the point I'm trying to make is that the site distance we're talking about is to the existing cyclesway. Mm -hmm. and not to where the cycleway may be in the future. 
yes, it, it has been dealt with. Okay. Anything else, David? Uh, look, I guess the um, uh, the only other comment, I guess, is the the um, the building form uh, to the front of the road. I think you know um, the fact that it goes from um, from uh, boundary to boundary and is right uh, on the uh, and is only you know uh, three meters setback. I think um, I think there's there is an issue there with um, you know kind of a bit of a canyon canyon effect. Um, uh, that really doesn't um, um, fit in with the perhaps the character of some of the other adjoining properties. But look, I guess that's uh, that may be something that um, uh, is a personal view or a, a, a personal perception. But uh, that certainly seems to be um, a major change to that to that site that's being proposed. Okay. Right. Um. In terms of my issues, they're essentially the, the same as, as the things that have been raised by others in relation to exceedance of standards in relation to height and floor space, um, and particularly the, uh, the, the traffic questions as well, um, the setbacks, those sorts of things. Um, so I don't need to restate them. Um, Helen, what would you, your bonus question? Right, being about two or 300 metres away from the site, living here for over 20 years, 25 years, um, when there were the, the emphasis on the CBD aspect of it, there is a, where there were three or four shops to start with, there's one little shop left in existence with opening three, day, three days a week or four days a week up until, say, morning tea's over. Um, and for that emphasis to be there, I just don't understand why, why we're talking about having a business operating there in such a busy area where I'd say I'm probably the only person around here that hasn't been rear-ended on Brisbane Water Drive entering this, these areas, Cooch Crescent and those areas. So I just don't foresee the congestion that... Uh, this building will bring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, do um, Mr. Levy or Mr. Dixon wish to respond in relation to those issues? No, Madam Chair, other than to say that the site is zone commercial. Um, nothing further to add. Uh, sorry, can I uh, just ask one question, further question, uh, and that is um, uh, people leaving this site um, where they uh, in a vehicle where they want to go to Gosford how would they uh, transact that uh, that movement? You mean the thing about they have to turn left from the driveway? Well, they do. They have to turn. They can't turn directly to go towards Gosford. Um, mm. They would have to turn south to go towards Woi Woi. Um, where would you anticipate they would turn around uh, to come back north to go to Gosford? Look, I, I can only respond at the first available. Uh, place and the, the the direction that cars will go would be the same direction that the cars go from the site at the moment and all of the uh, surrounding sites. Okay, um, if anybody has, um, it, assuming there's nobody has any further questions, I might um, draw a line under the public part of the meeting at this point. Last last. Bids, anyone? No? Okay. All right, here comes another spiel to read out. Um, I'm going to now formally close this meeting of the Central Coast Local Planning Panel. Um, as I said earlier, what we will do now is adjourn to deliberate and given that this is an electronic meeting rather than a face-to-face -face meeting rather than coming back to, um, to announce the panel's decision, we will endeavour to get that published on Council's website ASAP. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who attended and took part, including my fellow panel members, members of the community, representatives of the applicants and Council staff. Um, I remind the, the panel members that the, your job now is to click on the alternative Zoom link to move into the deliberative part of the discussion and I'll formally close the public meeting. Thank you.